Thank you very much, Zach. Um, my name is Mike Jacob, one of the co-founders of Kiss House. Uh, great to see everybody here today. Uh, really looking forward to this very personal looking presentation. Um, I had a sneak preview of the film that we're about to see a couple of days ago. And what's great is we're, we're gonna get an insight into, um, well, the guts of a building that, that may never have been seen had it have been in the hands of, I say, uh, a less conscientious owner. Um, and we get to see as his kids involved in the project and the mountains emerging and all sorts of wonderful things. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, so yeah, thanks very much. Over to you, Hugh. Yeah, cheers, Mike. Um, I'm Hugh Wierski, director at Partel, and pretty much, Mike, I was going to say the same thing as you. Yeah, just some, I followed a little bit of Ez's journey on Twitter, um, so really looking forward to getting into the detail on that. But yeah, like you say, some of those images are um, they're going to be good for everyone to see, and maybe it will encourage people to um, take that look deeper into what's behind those walls that they can't see. Um, yeah, so Ben, over to you. And there's also the story element of this that uh, it's quite a journey, as I'm sure we'll unpack as we go through this. So I'm going to do the introduction here. After getting a degree in ecology, Ez Trezida's journey to low energy buildings incorporated time working in an earth ship and teaching children in schools about recycling. They then followed an MSc at CAT, the Center for Alternative Technology, and a PhD in optimization of low energy building design at De Montfort University. Initially skeptical about Passive House, his interest grew upon interacting with the wonderful world of Twitter, the Passive House community on there. He then completed the Passive House Designer course, which he credits with teaching him more about building physics in two weeks than he learnt about in the entire duration of his MSc and PhD. Ez ran his own consultancy, Highland Passive, for a few years before moving to work full time as a Passive House specialist for John Gilbert Architects, probably one of the top sustainable architecture firms in Scotland. He's in the final stages. He's moved back in of retrofitting his home. There are a couple of things we haven't shown, that room full of bags and everything that he's unpacking. But um, this is in Fort William in Scotland. We're now going to take a look at uh, his video. This is a nearly completed benefit of a 1975 timber frame house on the west coast of Scotland. We had been living here for five or six years before we decided to start the retrofit and the motivation for that was on multiple fronts really. The house was too cold, it had damp and mould problems in places, it was expensive to heat, but also upstairs the space was really poorly laid out. It's what's called a one and a half storey house, which is very typical for around here, where the slope of the roof comes down to meet the ceiling of the ground floor. And so the, the floor area available upstairs is quite dramatically reduced compared to the full footprint of the house. The retrofit that we did was very radical in many ways, but addressed that. We did think about whether we should sell the house and build new elsewhere or knock the house down and build new here. The location where we are is really great for us. It's close to schools, walking distance to schools, cycling distance to town, so we don't need to use the car much at all. Um, it's five minutes walk to a train station if we're going further afield. So the location was really key for us and that was the reason not to sell and build somewhere else really. And then the question was, do we knock down and build new or do we retrofit? And I'm pretty sure that what we did was cheaper than knocking down and building again. But also I think I would have, from a conceptual point of view, knocking down buildings that have still got plenty of life in them feels the wrong thing to be doing in terms of, in terms of um, carbon emissions really and r using resources wisely. Um, so yeah, we chose to retrofit and before we started we knew that we had a problem with, with damp and um, we would get mould in the back of cupboards and in corners and sometimes around windows and when we stripped the house back we realised that the problem was much more extensive. We discovered quite a lot of pretty badly done 
work. This bit here used to be a doorway, so at some point it was filled in before me. And then the way that a timber frame works is that you want to have um, a ventilated cavity between the block work and the timber frame. They just filled this with insulation flush with the block work. They didn't reinstate the ventilated cavity, so that got really, really damp and there was lots of black mould um, and had plants growing in it and all sorts of things. It was pretty disgusting. These are 100 millimetre deep studs and previously there was just about 10 or 15 millimetres of glass wool insulation in there. It had loads of mould in it because the air is leaking into the structure and condensing and causing dampness and mould. So we're fully filling them with 100 mil bats of this is hemp and jute insulation. So fully filling it helps with the mould because there's less air in there and mould likes to have a bit of air. Um, and the hemp and jute is hygroscopic, so any moisture that does form can dissipate um, throughout the, the, the hemp and jute, whereas something like glass wool um, isn't able to dissipate moisture in that way. And then we're going to have another 40 mil of wood fibre board inside that, and then an intelligent air tightness membrane. Most of the time that acts as a, a vapour barrier, so it stops moisture from the room getting into the wall buildup, but in very sunny weather you can get um, something called reverse diffusion where the sun is shining on the wall outside and it drives moisture from the outside of the wall through to the inside um, and because I'd, I've not been in control about what the sheathing board was on the outside because that's pre-existing, I want the wall to be able to dry out in both directions so I'm trying to make a wall um, that is very uh, moisture robust so I'm using hygroscopic and vapour open insulation and then I'm using a vapour barrier that is variable so that it can dry out in both directions. So this is the living room and we've got two big changes we're making here. When you're sat in a sofa over at the other side of the room the, the view of Ben Nevis is split by this mullion which always seems a shame to me so we're going to replace it with a, a single um, piece of glass. Uh, make it a bit higher off the ground to reduce um, solar gains in the summer. Uh, to reduce the overheating problem because this room already overheats a bit on sunny days so that will help a little bit with that. We're also going to be putting another window in over there where you can see there was a window before. I don't know why they took it out. We're going to be putting a, an opening window in there so that will even the light out a bit in the room nicely and will enable us to cool the room when it gets too hot because um, w w with this sliding door we, we found that you, know, you, didn't, you didn't really want to leave a whole sliding door open, so it would, it would just get really hot in here in summer some days. Lots of what I did early on, well, everything that I did early on was, was DIY by me. And I always wanted to stay doing the insulation and the air tightness and the MVHR installation, partly as a kind of professional upskilling for myself and partly just because I think those are the areas that the existing building trade is generally lacking lots of experience in and I wanted to make sure that it was done really well. But I always knew that the bigger things that we were going to be doing in terms of um, taking the roof off and rebuilding that first floor, um, I was never going to do those as a DIY job. So we employed a local joinery contractors who were interested in doing Passive House and had some existing experience on it and were, were keen to continue learning there. Generally clients doing part of the contract for us is a bit of a no-no basically because it can complicate the contract sometimes um, and also you know your client contractor relationship can get a little bit frayed if you are not moving in the same direction but due to Ez's background and experience with Passive House and Interfit we knew that having Ez would probably be more of a benefit to us uh, than a drawback so it was quite an easy decision on this project to let Ez come on with us and, and, and work together. The main job for us was to take the roof off. The actual roof design itself was quite complicated, you know, engineer and architect drawings for it and there was a lot of back and forth, shall we say, between us and the engineers because some of the details were really complicated and there had to be a little bit of negotiation about how to go about them because sometimes it's easier to draw it on paper than it is to do it in real life and there was compromises made on both sides in the end but we all got what we wanted to get the roof of it like as i said that was the main challenge and the second challenge was the air tightness layer so the air tightness board on the inside of the eye joist 
putting the boards on and you know trying to have no gaps trying to make sure the joints are taped taped around the windows that was a real big part of making the project what it needed to be because if you get these details wrong it, the house would never have hit the target that we needed it to hit it was challenging at times for both of us because i was never able to work fast enough to keep up with with them i was working in the evenings and at weekends i was having to upskill myself and you know they were a team of between two and eight guys who were working full time and um, obviously had most of the skills that they needed already or all the skills they needed already there were several points where things happened too quickly and we didn't do an interim air pressure test because to make that worthwhile you need to have the air barrier visible so that you can find leaks and fix them before the air barrier gets covered over but by the time the builders were wanting to put the plasterboard up um, I hadn't finished the air barrier in some places of the house so there was no point in doing a pressure test at that point and you know that's totally understandable for, from their point of view they want to go as quickly as possible which well it's kind of what I wanted as well because we wanted to be out of the house as, as short a time as possible but it meant that that interim test that is usually very important wasn't done and so I, I kind of just had to do as good a job on the air tank as they could and hope that it had been good enough and we've just had the final air pressure test and we got a really good result for that. Yeah I guess a way around that would have been for me to project manage the whole thing and to employ different trades at different points in the process. I think that would have been more stressful than what we did. I think it was quite helpful having Steve project manage everything um, and certainly quicker. It's probably taken up a lot of our sort of management time on it to pull it through to the finish line. But I think in the long term, what, what we'll take away from it as a company and, you know, what we've learned from it, it wouldn't frighten us, you know, taking one on again. And if we did go to do something like this again, we'd be a lot more efficient than we were this time. So if you look at the company and you look at our margins, we'd be more effective and more efficient at delivering the same thing. The most annoying thing has been my dad being busy, but it's been interesting seeing like what there is behind the walls of a house and helping. So I helped lift up the floorboards and put the insulation in there. I helped quite a bit with the air tightness and stuff. Uh, it's a lot better. It's more comfortable and a lot warmer. Partly it's because it's quite a bit bigger and I have my own room and also it's just a lot warmer and nicer to live in and got windows in better places and yeah it's just nice and almost everywhere. The first week we moved in was pretty cold, it was like nearly freezing overnight and then I think maybe getting up to a high of six degrees in the day. Um, so the heating was on then and that was a really good test of this really simple heating system that we've gone for of just a single air to air heat pump in the dining room and that's heating the whole house. Because our space heating is from an air to air heat pump uh, we need a separate way of heating our hot water and this is um, a, a dedicated heat pump water heater. So it has a small heat pump that sits here that takes heat from the air. So you've got an inlet here and an outlet here that I've just stuck that on to stop recirculating too much. And you can either duck that to outside, um, duck both of these to outside, or it can take the heat from the room. So I've set it up to take the heat from the room for, for various reasons. Um, and that seems to be working really well. So it's just a small heat pump that sits on top of a, um, a 200 litre hot water tank in this case. Obviously it's only a month of being in it, but um, I'm really encouraged by how, how it works thermally. Loads of things that you know, I knew about as a passive house designer, but are still quite surprising, like taking a shower and then hanging a towel up. I took a shower one evening at like 11 p.m. at night and the next morning my towel was bone dry and there's no radiator in there, no, no heated towel rail, it's just um, you know in a 20 degree room with good ventilation and that dries things out really quickly. So yeah, super comfortable to live in. Even when it's cold we're walking around with just one, one jumper on, one sweater on. If you're a bit more active you go down to a t-shirt, if you're a bit less active you put your sweater back on. It's super, super nice. 
what we did here was really, really radical, and I still need to really sit down and think about whether it was the right thing to do. I mean, it's resulted in a, an amazing place to live, and so I'm, I'm not going to regret it, but it was really radical to take the roof off and take the first floor down. If all we'd done was was retrofit the existing structure, it would have been a lot simpler and a lot cheaper. And I'm kind of hopeful and optimistic about the the scope for there being like a DIY approach for these these timber frame houses, which are almost ubiquitous in this part of the world. Like it's it's how all the houses are built and have been since the 80s, really. And this type of housing lends itself to a DIY approach with some expert input. I think the expert input is really important because there's quite a few places you could go badly wrong. Um, and they're kind of specific to each project, but I think this, there is real scope for um, for having like a, a DIY-led approach. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to go through a bit more detail of uh, of the kind of key details of of what we did on the house in terms of the fabric of the building. And if people are interested in other aspects, then they can bring that up in the in the Q and A. But this is just a, a quick presentation, so I thought I'd focus on. The, the fabric of the house and primarily looking at the retrofit bits of the house rather than focusing a lot on what we did upstairs, which was essentially a new build. Um, so, yeah, we started with this this house at the top, um, one and a half story house, two small um, windows facing funny directions when there was an amazing view to the south and um, the, the, the windows um, in the uh, in the bedrooms upstairs, one of them had a, a view to the south, the one that you can see there at the top. Um, the two bigger bedrooms had a view. Um, one one had a view of the neighbour's wall, and um, and a, a trickle vent directly above their um, their oil boiler flue. And the other bedroom had a, a view of a, a tree a, a few metres away. And um, when there's this amazing view of the mountains just to the south, so um, we were keen to get more space, and we were keen to get better views and better light in each bedroom um, so i'm just going to talk through the details from the ground up really so we, we had a suspended floor with no insulation in it at all and i mentioned that we didn't do an interim air test but we did actually do an air test before we started on the project um, and it was very interesting when we depressurized the house all the carpets on the ground floor lifted <laughs> there was basically just air leaking through the floor everywhere and um, so that's, you know, that's a, a really big impact on comfort, both in terms of, of drafts and in terms of um, in terms of walking around on a surface that's cold all of all the time, even probably even in the middle of summer, it'll still be still be cold. Um, so we insulated between the joists. The joists were um, 180 mil deep. And at the time in PHPP9, in order to meet the NFIT component criteria, you have to hit um, a U value of 0.15 or less for each of the elements. Um, so for the ground floor, I needed to add more insulation underneath the joists. Um, and what you see here was my first, um, first or one of the early iterations of, of what I thought I would do, um, which was to add a block of wood fiber insulation underneath each joist. And actually, I simplified it from this. I just had a I extended the joist with a, a bit of nine mil ply, and I suspended a, um, a breather membrane between those those joist extensions, and then I filled that with loose fill um, wood fiber insulation, the sort of wood fiber insulation that you normally blow into walls with a big machine. But um, I was mixing it with a with a drill with a a big kind of paint mixer thing on the end, um, and then putting it into the floor directly like that, and that worked very well. Um, so this is with the floor. This is what we were starting with. It was it was dry. It was once all the rubbish had been taken out of it, it was pretty clean. Um, so we didn't have a kind of existing damp problem in the floor, which was a relief. Um, the, the 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 subfloor was had like a bituminous um, covering, so it was it was pretty there's pretty low low moisture input from from the ground in this situation, which is which is good. Um, so you can see here, I'm extending the joists with the nine mil ply and then um, suspending a, a breathable membrane 
and that's um to, does does several things it holds the insulation in place um, but it's also uh windproof so that uh, when you've got air movement in the solum in the space underneath the floor that's not getting into the insulation and um, reducing the effectiveness of the insulation through wind washing um it's really critical that that's vapor permeable so that the water vapor moving through the structure can escape into the solum and the solum is ventilated so the the, the moisture can then get out of of there um i think with the floor this is one bit where i would really think carefully about how i'd do this again if i did it again extending the joist like this was really labor intensive and i i don't think i would do it like this i'm not sure exactly how i would do it i've got several ideas of how i'd do it and if i get another project like this i'll sit down and work out which one's best but doing it this way was a lot of work for an extra 100 mil of insulation was how it felt um and i actually had to do this i had to take i'd put all the insulation in and then i had to take it all out again because it all got soaked when we took the roof off but that's another story that's another story for another day maybe so we were filling it with um with this loose fill wood fiber that you can see in the, in the top of the picture there um we didn't take the stair up and that gave us a bit of a an air tightness headache like how do you make it airtight underneath where the stair is landing um maybe we should have just taken the stair up but at that point in my retrofit journey i was still very um very wary of taking on big bits of diy i was still pretty fearful of those and taking the stair out just seemed terrifying to me so i didn't do that and um uh, so i'll show you in a minute how we did the air tightness there so yeah fully filling filling the void with this filling the 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 spaces that I'd created between the joists with this wood loose fill wood fiber that was really good because we had complex spaces to fill it was really good at being able to fill all the spaces with no air gaps um but it was quite a lot of work to get in uh and it's it's relative, compared to other natural insulations it's very cheap so it's kind of swings and roundabouts it was a lot of work it was very effective um but it it, it um but it was really cheap so, so it was very it's very cheap and very effective, but it was a lot of work. So yeah, swings and roundabouts. Um, this was the method we used for ensuring air tightness under the stairs was to send a keen small child <laughs> into the solar. <laughs> and <laughs> he did a really good job. It was actually his idea to go down. I'd like to emphasize that it wasn't, I wasn't encouraging him at all. Um, I couldn't fit in there. He could just, and um, yeah, so we, we put him down there for, for 20 minutes to tape to tape the um the air tightness membrane into place and that worked really well we had a, a good result from our air tightness test a couple of weeks ago so that was reassuring um then this is the the ground floor walls so we the existing studs were 100 mil deep and then they just had plasterboard straight on top of that so i was removing the plasterboard and um and then filling the studs with um, 100 mil of hemp and jute insulation and then the pink board on top of the studs there inside the studs that you can see there was another um sheathing board the the structural engineer wanted us to increase the strength of the ground floor walls um by uh, and and also tie in the new studs that we were putting in around windows um to ensure that it was strong enough to take the extra load that we were adding upstairs so there's another another sheathing board and then 40 mil of wood fiber board insulation and then um, an air tightness intelligent membrane um, and then a 40 mil service cavity that in this picture is insulated and we actually didn't insulate it that just um, struck me as being quite a pain and quite a lot of um, I think the electrician and the plumbers would have been quite hostile to me filling it with insulation so um, I went for the easy life there and I think I, I probably would keep it that way I think service cavities are best left unfilled um and yeah that's so that's what we did um in terms of kind of throughout this process i was always often thinking like if i did a shallow retrofit rather than deep retrofit what would we have done and i think what most builders locally would have done if you said you wanted to insulate a house like this is they would have just come in and put in um, insulated plasterboard on top of the plasterboard that was there already and um i'll just show you what i think that would have meant um so this is what we had already this is what we would have been putting insulated plasterboard on top of <laughs> and given that you're not really 
um, doing very much about air tightness and you're making the wall, the existing wall colder because you're adding insulation inside of that. Um, I think this mold problem would get even worse if you'd just done that. So um, I think that's fairly grim. So what was going on here, the, the left picture is a mix of rotten, um, of moldy insulation and um, rodent feces and rodent skeletons and all sorts of horrible, horrible things. Um, and then the other two are, are just, you know, bog standard mold. Uh, interestingly, the the worst black mold in that central photo is where the um, where the socket is. So that the air is leaking around the the socket. Um, the, the the socket gives a, a path through the plasterboard, so more air is leaking through there, bringing in. Um, warm moisture laden air into that space uh, which then cools and the humidity goes high enough that you get mold um just going back to this the other thing that that i i would was thinking as i was doing it, it was if all i did was was this you know if i wasn't adding for example was it worth adding the 40 mil of insulation board well you've got more thermal bridging through the studs but also um are you able to see my mouse actually Yes. Okay. Also, um, the, the what was drawn here, this was drawn before we took the walls apart. And actually the studs were, there was one stud like this, and then this stud wasn't here, it was here. So if you, if, if all I had done was insulated between the studs, then there would have been a space here where it would have been impossible to get any insulation. And I would have had a cold corner that is already a, a geometric thermal bridge and um and it's a corner so there's less air flow around it and i think you'd just end up with a load of mold um internally if, if i'd done that or that would be the risk maybe it'd be all right with mvhr but um that would that would certainly be the risk i think um so this was uh filling the walls with the hemp and jute bats um these come conveniently sized to fit either 600 mil center studs or 400 mil center studs um, my house was like sometimes 400, sometimes 420, sometimes 360. Um, it was all over the place. So I was having to cut them quite a lot. Um, if you have to cut natural insulation, get an insulation saw. Um, I tried all sorts of saws before finally spending 30 pounds or whatever on an insulation saw and wished I'd done it earlier. Um, lots of studs that were kind of a little bit apart and and you had to kind of poke insulation into them to make sure that there weren't any gaps in in the wall build up um, and all of this like you can see there there's there's three studs right next to each other and another stud right there and if we hadn't been adding the the wood fiber insulation inside of that um i don't think it would have been a moisture risk problem because the, the wood is okay but um you would have ended up with a, a, certainly a surface that was colder than the rest of the wall uh, so this is finishing the wall off. So this is the, the wood fiber, um, sorry, the, the sheathing board that we added internally. So behind that is the existing 100 mil studs with the hemp and jute. And then, then to the left of that, we've got the 40 mil of wood fiber board that we added on. And then the membranes are going up. And you can see that everything's happening in funny orders. They're already trying to, the, the timber at the bottom is them strapping the walls for the plasterboard. Um, so I was run, rushing around trying to keep up. And then window reveals. Uh, some of this was worked out beforehand. Some of it was was um, working out on site. I had bits of 20 mil insulation left, left over that I was able to um, cut to fit exactly into the window reveals. And that gave a good edge for, for bringing the tape, the, the membrane round and then taping it to the windows. Um, if I did windows again, I think I would tape them um before they went in I'd, I'd use split release tape which i did use um and i'd take them to the window frame and then put them in and then have the the second release tape to use um separately the way i did it was effective but it was quite fiddly and there are a few places where you can still where you can just see a little bit of tape internally and then upstairs we did a, an eye joist um frame uh, effectively and there are a few bits that that we could have done better there that are more relevant to new build but i think are easily missed so here we've got um, a junction that you can't access this point here from inside so for blowing the insulation in you blow all the for these spaces you blow them in from the inside 
but this space you have to go out on the scaffolding and blow it in from the outside which is annoying if it's raining um, and it's often raining in this part of the world so um, make sure that your stud arrangement at the corners it gives you a path so that you, you maybe have one of these offset down here somewhere you need to clear it with your structural engineer so that you've got a path into this space um, for the for the blown in insulation this is the junction between the ground floor and the first floor so this was a bit of a structural engineering headache for for the structural engineer um, and effectively we built like a um a ladder here um and 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 that enabled us to build a solid platform that we could then build the first floor walls off um, so this is it's not weighting this um it's, it's not loading this uh this block work wall it's all, all of the load is through this timber frame here um so that worked well um there are a few things that i i, I would do slightly differently mainly with the weatherproofing of it i think um it got it i i put the insulation in and then we tried to weatherproof it but these joints were open and basically the rain would come down here and then track through these joints and this all got completely soaked and i had to pull it out and then do it again um uh, once the walls the, the other parts of the walls were finished so i think i would try and find a better way of doing that um and yeah this is the the eye joist frame being built on top of the house for a long time the first couple of months we felt like they'd done loads of work we'd given them loads of money and all we had was half a house <laughs> but at this point it was starting to look like we were actually getting more getting getting a, a, a bigger house again um yeah the, these again this is probably more relevant to, to the new build um we i didn't think carefully enough about window positioning and window sizing in terms of the eye joist layout so um this the image on the on the left um if if i'd sized my windows or positioned my windows slightly differently i could have had fewer studs um because you've got a stud right next to the window and if you can line that up to be at your 600 centers or whatever centers you're needing it to be then that's a lot better than having two right next to each other and we also had to go i also had to go around and be be measuring them to check whether they are wide enough to have the insulation pumped into them from inside and if they weren't i was having to pre-fill them i didn't have to pre-fill i may have only had to pre-fill one of them but some of them were quite tricky to to fill and actually the drilling of the hole in in the airtight board is quite hard um, and quite time consuming so you want to limit the number of holes you have to drill and um, so you want to make sure that they're all spaced as well as they can be and yeah the end of the the process um it was like many extremely challenging things in life it was it was equal parts uh, wonderful and equal parts uh, horrifically traumatically stressful <laughs> but um we're in now and uh, it's lovely this this is the the sunrise on one of the first first mornings we were in um so condensation on the outside of the window and looking towards a frosty frosty ben nevis and uh, and glenn nevis there um and yeah i guess i'll just open it up for, for questions from there really that's that's me that's my presentation done <laughs> Thank you, Ez, very much indeed. That was really inspiring. And you just touched on the trauma at the end. I could sense it throughout. <laughs> you mentioned more than one um, uh, layer of insulation needing to be removed due to water damage. And yeah, I, yeah. I can imagine you're probably just scratching the surface. The, the yeah, I mean, that, that was a big thing for me. Like, basically, the the... A big learning point for me was was just how hard it is to keep water out of buildings when they're not finished. And um because basically all my experience is computer based until this. Um so it was a really steep learning curve. And we 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 were offered at the start of the project to to tent the whole thing. Um, but it would that that in itself was really expensive. I think we were quoted more than thirty thousand pounds for tenting it. And so we decided not to, and that meant that we had to redo the insulation in the ground floor all of it and we had to redo the insulation around that perimeter that i showed you yeah um so i think i would do those in a different order but i don't think i would tent it just because you know 30 grand is a lot of money for something that you just need to change the order that you do things in so that yeah. they can dry out um 
the, the, the thing that really stood out to me, or, or that at least that I kept thinking about, was the mold. Um, mm. And I'm thinking that, you know, you live in this really healthy um, part of the world in terms of the mountainous landscape and the fresh air and no doubt lots of healthy um, outdoor activities. And, and yet you're living, and as are many other people who live in those sorts of, of houses, in, in an unhealthy internal environment in terms of the, the mold. And you said you were there for five years. And I just wondered if you and your family had experienced any health impacts from that mold in in the period of time that you were living there up until you carried out the the uh, refurb. Um, it's hard to tell because we didn't have asthma, we didn't have rhinitis or anything like that that that's you know really known to be caused by mold. Mm. Um, so not necessarily, but it, it might have had a more a more subtle impact on our health than that. Yeah. Um, I think that 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 link between kind of outdoorsy people then living in unhealthy houses is really interesting because, you know, most of my friends are, are outdoorsy. So we're going out, we're getting soaked, we're coming back with wet clothes. Yeah. Um, or if you've got a dog, wet dogs as well. We haven't got a dog, but um, lots of people do. And I, I was reflecting that in Loch Arbor, which is this region, um, most houses have either a tumble dryer or a dehumidifier or mold and lots of them have all three of those things. <laughs> yeah, it's really, really common to see yeah, a dehumidifier in someone's house. Um, well, I, I commend you for doing it. It was really inspirational. Um, Hugh, uh, any observations from you? Yeah, I've got a couple of comments and maybe some questions. Um, so yeah, again, as thanks for being so open with the sharing. There's a, a wealth of information for people to you know to absorb and learn from. But the thing that kind of strikes me is um what is the what's the real lifespan of that house without your interventions um when you look at that from a structural point of view i think it was on a path to some fairly serious issues probably the same with health um same with running costs um and then if we look at the i suppose the 2050 um emissions that we target where there's I think 30 odd million homes that need to be retrofitted. It probably fits into that category. Um, and I'm wondering then, yeah, for all of the work you did, is there grants available? Were they available? And when you talk about things like roofs and removals, it really seems like, um, and you see, I see this a lot. It's an inevitable thing to have to do to upgrade that type of house that you really can't do it well enough without doing that. Um, that's, I suppose, a kind of a comment or a question is uh, th the other ones were, um, what were the reservations from you and your family about doing the work? And were you fully aware, I guess, of you said everything was computer based prior to that, yet you're obviously quite hands on and you've done, you know, a lot of work yourself there. I'm wondering how that part worked. Um, and the last one then is I love to see the water heater. It's really smart. Um, it's a smart solution in a lot of different ways for um, for your type of house. Um, mm. You know, even as you move to um, low energy, nighttime costs, I guess you can use it kind of as a battery. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're, we're doing, in terms of the heat pump, the water heater, yeah, we, we're heating our water at night and um, it's quite noisy when it's on, but it's, you know, it, we can't hear it from the bedroom, so that's okay. Um, and I've got some plans for how to make it less noisy in use so that when we get solar pv we can run yeah. off the solar pv during the day as well because it's it does give quite a useful amount of cooling um yeah. that at night time is a bit of a waste because you don't at this time of year anyway you don't really want it to cool the house at night yeah. um whereas in the middle of the day at this time of year you start certainly on sunny days it's, that would be you know to, certainly fine yeah, nice. to cool yeah. in the house. um in terms of yeah, the, the kind of taking it on and understanding how big a task it was. I, I, I suppose I'm like a bit of an optimist to a fault, and it was definitely more time and more work than I anticipated. Um, so that was, yeah, that's tough in terms of the family, but they, they were very supportive. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm lucky to have them. <laughs> um, and in terms of the lifespan of the house, yeah, I'm not a structural engineer, but I think you're right. Like that, that all of the studs were fine. There were no studs that were starting to get damp, but all of the sheathing board was was damp. 
and that strikes me as a thing that's not great in the long-term health of the house um i actually did something else that i didn't mention was that i realized that the the the, the cavity between the block work and the timber frame didn't have any deliberate ventilation yeah. um and so i think that was part of the reason that the mold was so bad um so i actually drilled uh i drilled a hole along the bottom of the the walls yeah. and along the top of the walls every meter and a half or something and and put a little a little vent cover in um to to try and ventilate that space better um so i've kind of done lots of things that i think taken together will mean that the the, the walls not moldy anymore um and i'm also going to i've got some sensors that i'm going to put in both the floor and the walls so i can monitor what's happening there yeah really nice yeah well done look the the com the problems that you've come across they're, they're obviously in all of the houses you know built in that time so yeah mm. it's amazing information and pr probably the houses that we're building now to be honest like that's the scary thing is we're still building we're still yes. building houses like this just with more insulation they're still not very airtight and they're still not ventilated properly and they're still full of thermal bridges and missing insulation and it's pretty depressing <laughs> <laughs> Um, ben, had, what did you think? Um, you've been closer to it. Yeah, this is a project that has just been so interesting to me, both to watch on Twitter, read all the updates, uh, and also I've done a podcast. So I, I know all sorts of things. Just before I go any further, I'd like to thank Mike Coe and Lizzie Studley, who are based, I'll say near to Es, but that's still four hours away, who did the filming. So that was really good of them to head down there. Um, having seen quite a few retrofit projects now, I think that one of the key things is about making it somewhere that you want to live for, a, you know, you never know what the future holds, but a good few years. And I think that everything that you've done is to make that house a home for you for the foreseeable future. And I think that's the only way retrofit can work because it takes so much time it costs so much money and you know it, it it is in that balance but what i've always loved about um airs and what he's done is how honest and occasionally he'll say oh, i'm not sure whether this retrofit really works but you know he's always looking and analyzing and and just coming to his own conclusions but what is the alternative as, he, as he's saying it's it's difficult you don't want to trap all that mold and just forget about it because there probably is some unseen consequence that's going to happen so we better hand over to kim though because <laughs> i know there are quite a few questions that have come in during this Great, thank you, Ben. Um, all right, just a reminder for everyone, we will uh, go through the queue, ask you to come off of mute to ask as your question. Um, if you're unavailable to do so, please let me know in the chat ahead of time if possible, just so we can make this as efficient as possible. Uh, starting off today, we have um, Elisa. You can come Hi. off mute and ask your question. Can you, can you hear me? Hi, hello. Perfect. Yes. Ah, perfect. Thank you for the presentation. So um, I would like to ask if um, the house is uh, mechanically ventilated. Um, yeah, I would like to understand the ventilation strategy. And um, as a second question, I would like to ask uh, if you, I understood that you modeled um, with the PHPP your house. So I was curious to understand if you customize your internal gains based on your lifestyle. So, um, it's yeah, it's got MVHR. Um, you have to have MVHR for for NFIT or passive house in this part of the world, anyway. Um, that's been great. Um, I installed that myself, and uh, but it was designed and commissioned by uh, Paul Heat Recovery Scotland, who are really good. Um, it's a Zender Q50 um, unit. Um, I modelled it in PHPP. Yes, I should have mentioned that there's two methods that you can use to reach NFIT standard. There's NFIT. Um, energy standard, which is that you have to be below 25 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year. And there's NFIT component method, which if you're having to do lots of internal insulation where you can't get to such low U values, um, it's very difficult to get below 25 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year. So you tend to go for the component method instead. And it, there's a relaxation on the U values that you have to achieve for ground floor, for, for the walls, because if you're internally insulating, you can't get to such low U values without either a high moisture risk to the wall or losing lots of internal space so my walls on the ground floor are about 
0.26, I think, U value, whereas the top, the first floor, they're like 0.13. So um, uh, where am I going with this? So the, so we did, we wouldn't hit the 25 kilowatt hours. I think we were at 27 or 28. Um, did I customize the internal gains? Um, no, because I can't do that for certification. Um, I did a bit of that to test it for summer performance, but actually um, for here, the summer performance in this building in PHPP is is zero percent um, of the time over twenty five degrees, but actually because that averages out over the whole house, there is one room that I'm that I think might overheat, and that's the living room with the big window. And I kind of thought that from the start, and basically I'm just going to see how it goes. And if it does need more shading, I'll put a temporary shade up that I can take down. Um, I can put up at the beginning of the summer and take down at the end of the summer or some kind of trellis with trailing plants on it or something. But so far we've had, uh, so we haven't, you'll, you'll laugh at this hot weather, but we've had like 20 degrees and very sunny some days and the living room has got to 23 degrees. So that's fine, but it might in the middle of summer, we do sometimes get, sometimes get days where it's high twenties. Um, the sun will be higher in the sky at that time. So it may be that the solar gains are reduced enough that we don't overheat in that room, but it might. I'm, I'm also open to the idea that I might have to shade that that room on it, and, and everything else is fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Awesome. Okay, next up we have uh, Paul Carr with a a big question. <laughs> Hi. Thanks for the presentation. Um, you'd mentioned in the video, you know, if for retrofit versus. Uh, you know, just a demo and rebuild was the right choice. You still feel that way? And um, is it a cost-effective approach for the general public? I mean, you, you're an architect and you had a lot of hands-on. Could the general um, homeowner do what you did, do you think? So I'm not an architect, but um, uh, I am also was a beginner at DIY. Like the most ambitious thing I'd done in DIY, this isn't an exaggeration, was unblocking a sink before I did this project. So um, in terms of skill, in terms of practical skills, I was pretty lacking. I did the Passive House consult, uh, tradesperson course um, as, as a kind of thing to do for this course. But basic, DIY, you know, that doesn't teach basic DIY skills. It teaches you how to tape things properly and how to put insulation in properly. Um, so in terms of basic DIY skills, I was very lacking. Um, was it cost effective? It was very expensive. We now have a lovely place to live in a place we want to live. <laughs> so I'm looking at it. Um, I'm pretty sure it's cheaper than knocking it down and rebuilding just because we built less and we knocked stuff down and we knocked less stuff down. So on that basis, you know, we didn't have to build new foundations. And I I, I would I, I'm pretty sure. Um uh yeah, so yeah, it's cheaper than it, it was cheaper than the the typical cost for building a new house here. So um, yes, it might. What would have probably been more cost effective would have been to sell, buy a piece of land, and build a new passive house. But that would have been somewhere that was not as nice to live. Um, mm -hmm. Is is you know that's the trade off. Like there aren't bits of land available around this part. You know, to, to buy a new land around here, you pretty much commit yourself to a very car dependent lifestyle because you're ten miles from school you're 10 miles from all the clubs that your kids want to do um you're 10 miles from any train stations you know it's it's, it's this location is quite special as far as i'm concerned in terms of it, it's a bit a bit it, the ability to live here and not be ferrying kids around all the time and that's partly a my quality of life thing but it's also a, a quality of life for my kids thing like it's nice for them to gain their independence kind of organically rather than me ferrying them around until they're old enough to drive them themselves. That's, um, you know, like my son's 11 and he cycles to the climbing wall that's three miles away and cycles home on his own. And um, if we were living any of the places that we could buy somewhere, that we could buy land, that, that wouldn't be an option. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. All right, next up we have uh, Graham Williamson. Hey, yeah, Ez, thanks for that. Um, just to, it's more of a sort of technical question, but you mentioned that the the solum in your house was pretty dry. The the, the void underneath was 
was dry. Uh, I'm in a situation where my house is the opposite. It's quite damp under the floor. Would you have detailed the floor differently had that been your situation or would you just have ventilated it more fully? Um, I think it would depend on trying to work out what the dampness was coming from. Um, so I don't want to give <laughs> advice about yeah, something from, so critical here. From the ground itself. It's coming from the ground yeah. itself, right. Yeah. So I think if I would maybe look to improve the drainage so that it wasn't getting damp under there. But I think that are, there are solid floor options that I ruled out for my house that maybe I shouldn't have ruled out um, that I would look into um, if I was doing it again, I think. Yeah. Okay. So like things like just filling the solum with um, with uh, glass, uh, what's it called? Foam glass aggregate. Foam um, glass, yeah. Uh, but I'm, yeah, we've, I, we've got I a much, got much my... bigger uh, crawl space. So oh, you have, right, un okay. Unviable, yeah, yeah. but- That's yeah. a lot of foam glass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I haven't quite got my head around whether you need to have a path for the moisture to get out at all, or, you know, it's like one of my, is there a list on things? I've got a list of things that I would need to consider before taking on a project like this and advising. But yeah, I think I would investigate further whether there was a solid floor um, option that was, that, was, that was viable. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up we have uh, Evangelia. Sorry, I think I mispronounced that. Uh, if you're available, please come on and ask your question. Yeah, uh, thanks for that. Um, um, so, because you mentioned you prefer the retrofit rather than building a new one due to um, carbon reduction uh, as well as anything else. Um, so, do you have an estimate of how much of the original structure and materials were kept, roughly? Uh, yeah, about half. I would about half of it. <laughs> like so basically, the whole was kept. Yeah, the whole ground floor, uh, the whole all the foundations, the ground, and and in terms of embodied carbon, new foundations in a timber frame house is going to be where the bulk of your carbon emissions, your your new embodied carbon emissions would come from. So, if you can reuse the foundations, that's a big win and to start with. Uh, so all the foundations, the ground floor structure was reused. The ground floor walls were reused. The ground floor um, ceiling joists were reused. So the only things that were new in terms of the structure were the um, the kind of platform to hold the first floor walls, the first floor walls and the roof. So yeah, at least 50%, I would say. But I haven't actually done that calculation. But yeah, a pretty big amount. Um, if I'm allowed, I have two more questions. Uh, Kim, is it okay? So I carry on. Yeah, go ahead. That's fine. Um, a similar question for the floor. What was the strategy for the perimeter? And you mean is the floor at any point still ventilated? Yeah, it's still ventilated, and I actually added more ventilation. But it's all outside the wind tight. So the, the, there's, okay. there's there's now an airtight layer, a load of insulation, a wind tight layer, and then that space underneath the wind tight layer, I'm trying it's to ventilate as well as possible. Yeah. And what about the perimeter where the uh, timber joists meet the either, I don't know, is it the timber structure that they meet? It, or They a, meet a timber structure, a, yeah. So it's or not- block work. It's no. not block work, no, it's meeting a timber structure. Okay. Um, so it's not got the problem that you have in, um, a, where you have, a suspended floor in a masonry build and your the ends of your joists get cold and damp it's not got that problem so i wasn't worried about yeah that was yeah that someone was i saw someone else had asked about why i insulated internally rather than externally um i i again i i dismissed the possibility of doing it externally because i was worried about what would happen to any moisture that was in the walls or would get into the walls that needed to escape and You'd need to fill. You'd need to fill the cavity, and then you need to insulate on top of that, like on the outside of the of the block work. Um, but that would be a possibility, I think. I think with a bit of thought, you could probably make it work. It'd be much harder to DIY, I think. I think what I did. My, DIY. And my final one is: Do you have the result of the airtightness test? Yeah, we got point four six. 
uh, changes per hour at 50 pascals. Well so, done. Thanks so, a lot um, yeah. for answering my questions. Great, thank you so much. And it was uh, oh. before, 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 the before works air uh, tightness was about 16. So <laughs> wow. we didn't get a yeah, proper, no for proper number, but, but it was about 16. Awesome, great questions. Thank you very much. Uh, well, we are at the top of the hour, so I'm just gonna hand it back over to our hosts to say some final words, and then we will continue on with a few uh, questions that we have left. So if you had a last minute question, feel free to drop it in the chat and we'll see if we can uh, fit it in, but I will start off handing it over to Mike. Thanks, Kim. Um, and uh, thanks to Ez and everybody else. It looks like there's still a few more questions to go. So I'll shut up now. <laughs> thanks, everybody. Yeah, and thanks. I'll just say um, a big thank you as well for Ez for doing that. Um, two points, really. One on upskilling that uh, it's an amazing upskilling journey that he's done. And I, I feel like I was at the, uh, the starting point. I'm still there and inspired by what he's done because you can get complacent with learning, can't you? But then if you put yourself in this extreme learning, that's when you, you move on. And I imagine this must have fed back into your work at John Gilbert Architects a lot. So that's all good. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much, Hugh. Yeah, um, it is amazing result on the airtightness I meant to ask. So that's <laughs> incredible. And without a pretest, um, yeah, amazing. So um, quite Yeah, exactly. it makes me wonder, like, if we'd done a pretest and found all those few little leaks, we would have got even better. <laughs> the, the perfectionist in you. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, but well, interestingly, it, it, I think it is interesting, like, we, like, we didn't need to get 0.46. And we did work very hard. The difficulty with air tightness is, is you can't really say, oh, don't bother doing that bit because you can get away with not doing that. It's really hard yeah. to say that. You, like you've got to kind of aim for zero and then know that you're not yep. going to quite get to zero. It's, it's tricky. There are a lot of air tightness things I would do differently, but we got a good result. Yeah, well um, done. Yeah, yeah thanks. And then so I guess back to you, Kim. Great. Thank you, Hugh. Uh, next up, we have a question uh, from John Darley. It looks like you're still here. Um, are you able to come off mute and ask your question? Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, John. Thanks. Hi. Um, great project, guys. Thanks, Sharon. Um, in terms of the floor, you've kind of hinted at it, but would you consider um, doing a natural fl solid floor, for example, lacquer or cork and earth on top of that or would you consider just doing the timber floor in a different way so my understanding from my structural engineer was that i needed to keep the the racking strength of having the the floor joists with floorboards or chipboard on top of them and so I, as i understood it i needed to keep those joists and so i think that i think that would rule out doing like an, an earth floor um but in terms of you know, if it would work, then sure. But I th yeah, it, assuming that I have to keep those joists, I think I would investigate other ways of keeping those joists than than what I did. Um, yeah, or, or doing what I did, but with less, with a better way of getting insulation under the joists um, than, than the way I did it, because it was a lot of work. Great, John, does that um, answer your question? All good? Yes, thanks. Sir. Okay, perfect. Um, next, we have Andy Hall. I think that you mentioned this partially, but um, I'll let him come on and see if he has any I think I saw something saying he'd just left, but I can, uh, I saw it, so I can, he said, you mentioned that even if doing a lot of DIY, you still need expert input for a few t few tasks. Um, I think the, the issue there was things that I found on site that, that we kind of realized, oh, the way we had intended to do this won't work because there's a serious moisture risk or there's a serious thermal bridging risk, or it doesn't look how we thought it would work, look. Um, and the the key one that I remember was the junction for the, um, for the floorboards, uh, putting the floorboards in and having the wood fiber board in the walls. The way that we'd drawn it was that the floorboards would go back in the same place as they had done then the wood fiber board would come down and then you'd have a situation where the air tightness layer kind of went in this circuitous route 
And because it was on the cold side, it went to a very cold place. And when you modeled it, there would be a, a moisture risk to the end of your floorboards. So you'd, you'd end up potentially getting the ends of your floorboards rotting. Um, so uh, that was a just one memorable bit, but there were quite often you come across something that's different from what you were expecting or different from what's in a book. And you have to think about how you're going to do it. And I think doing that without the input of someone who has a very good understanding of um, hydrothermal performance in buildings and thermal bridging would be really risky. Um, I think there's a, there's big scope for there's big scope for doing it with a DIY method, but um, most a lot of the DIY stuff that you see, people are making mistakes that make you wince. Well, that's how I experience it anyway. <laughs> um, and I think there's a because everyone has a house or everyone has somewhere that they live everyone everyone it's common for people like i don't know i'll speak to someone at the school gates and i'll say i'm doing this and i say oh i and they'll say oh i insulated my loft or my walls recently and and then you know that you're in for a conversation where you just have to keep a neutral face because um, because you because they'll tell you how you did it and you, you'll be wincing so i think uh, 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 people and and the and yeah, I think people doing this kind of deep retrofit without either doing a massive amount of upskilling of their own knowledge in terms of building physics is really risky. But and I think the way around that is to have a combination of expert input and and DIY doing the stuff. Um, yeah, I think there's big scope for that Dunning Kruger thing where you you, you think. You, know, you understand more than you do and that's very dangerous wonderful so that was that Andy's question like, that seems like a very good place to start to wrap up here um we had one last question come in it looks like david rimmer has left um i think you you entered answered this partially but he was asking about uh, making your house smaller internally at the ground floor and and just impacts of I think living in yeah I, I, so we lost 100 mil on all the external walls but it, we actually overall gained space on the ground floor because there was a bit of rearranging of space on the ground floor and we lost um, a wood burning stove which was taking up lots of space um, and we had one wall that wasn't insulated but had like 200 mil of fake stone cladding internally and so we took that off so we won what we won space there. So overall, overall, it's bigger on the ground floor, but that's not what usually happens when you insulate internally. <laughs> we had a funny porch that like nicked into the house and for no apparent reason. And, and we made that, we made the, the external door flush with the, with the main walls rather than kind of nicking into the house. And that gained us quite a lot of space. Um, so actually we, 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 we gained space on the ground floor as well, as well as upstairs. Wonderful. Um, all right, I think that that is it for questions. I'd like to just take a quick moment, moment to thank you, Mike, Hugh, and Ben uh, for hosting today. And as thank you so much for this great presentation. Um, I have put okay. the link to the recording in the chat for folks. Um, if you'd like to share it with your networks, please uh, please do, and we'll have that up in the next couple of days. Uh, but as it, do you have any any closing words or any advice for folks that no, are inspired? Thank, thanks very much. <laughs> Um, I guess the advice is like get yourself committed and then you don't have any choice but to do a good job like if you take your roof off then you know you've, you've got to finish the job then haven't you <laughs> so uh, yeah good luck and enjoy it. Well, 